don't think really when we started that, that any of us ever had this vision of what we would be doing in 10 years. I, I mean, I still don't now. I don't think of what I will be doing in 10 years. I don't think many people do. Um, if you're involved in anything creative, you can't really allow yourself to think about security, which is all thinking about the future is, really. Thinking if you're going to be in a better position or a worse position. Um, I always hoped that we'd be able to keep going until we wanted to stop, but I didn't know if that would be like 10 days or 10 years. Disintegration is an album as beloved as it gets, one that not only helped define the band that made it, but in many ways rebirthed them for the decades to come. Back in the 80s, The Cure went through a full circle of identities, starting out as a pop group only to evolve into a dark post-punk band and become one of the most defining artists of that scene, only to then evolve into a lighter psychedelic act just to return a few years later to pop. A wild ride of sounds and tones for a group to go through in only a string of about 10 years. But it didn't even stop there, because during the final breath of the decade, band leader Robert Smith would once again reach into the somber depths, and Disintegration was the album he pulled from it. Defined by its balancing act of light and dark, all while portraying a melancholic sound unlike anything else, to many, it's the band's magnum opus, and I think that says a lot about just what kind of record we're about to talk about. It's an album that truly speaks for itself, with some of the band's best songwriting and most cutting lyrics, bearing a depressive and very human heart most artists fail to even get close to portraying. But Disintegration wasn't just born out of an artist's desire to create. Rather, it was an attempt to capture and cope with the feeling of one's mortality, facing the end of their youth and realizing that time waits for no man. As disintegration was birthed from Robert Smith's inability to cope with the fact that his 20s were now going to be behind him. And through wrestling with this reality, it really caused him to reflect on his life and reflect on his career. All while being trapped in the existential dread that comes with realizing that age comes for us all. It's a battle that we'll all face at some point, as we stumble into the next chapter of our lives, and no album, I think, portrays this better than this core-soaked masterpiece. So, let's take some time to indulge and dissect one of the best albums to ever be put to tape, and take a dive into the somber world of disintegration. always change the mainstream of uh, music you know if you're popular you're popular it's not necessarily um, that you've changed yourself or you're compromised your particular way of doing things there's no snobbery involved in what we do at all and there's no elitism or eclecticism it's just there I mean as long as we've never compromised our own ideals, own ideals right. then it doesn't really matter I mean if we were to have a record that sold three million I very much doubt if we'd all cry back into our hungry right. cellars, you know, and, and our poetry books. The Cure's story isn't really one that needs much of a retelling, but I do think it's important to delve into it a bit in order to get a full understanding of the context of how Disintegration came to be. The band formed in 1978 as a three-piece post-punk group, quickly carving themselves into the history books with their innovative songwriting and far-reaching influence in turn becoming one of post-punk's frontrunners, and the band's daunting image and hazy sound would go on to build them up as a formative figure in the early days of goth music, a title that Robert Smith still rejects to this day, but is undoubtedly one of the most prominent and influential figures of. 
And while their early years are well worth a full exploration in a video of its own, the contrast in sounds that the band went through is extremely pressing when speaking about disintegration. The Cure's first release, Three Imaginary Boys, was post-punk for sure, but in a way that blended 70s power pop and new wave into the mix. This would bring the band some early success, but just like contemporaries Depeche Mode, this poppy and radio-friendly sound wouldn't last for very long, as the band obviously wanted to branch out into their own path. And their second record, 17 Seconds, was a stark contrast to their brighter and lighter sound of before. As you can hear, all the joy and boyish charm that once made them who they were is gone, replaced by a looming sense of dread and dysphoria. 17 Seconds would also help the band ground themselves as more than just a one-hit wonder, cementing the band as a newcomer that was here to stay, though it also helped show that the band had a greater interest in exploring the darker and more ethereal side of music. And during this time, we would also get interviews like this. Charts Char a reflection of, of obviously of, of like a general taste, and and I think the general taste is usually pretty vile, I and mean, it's awful because most people. Are... Where Robert would openly shit on pop music and absolutely reject being seen as anyone other than himself. I once read that you were called the Pink Floyd of the '80s. What do you think of that? Shit. <laughs> Uh, we're not at all. They're the cure of the eighties, not Pink Floyd. This bitterness and anger would only continue to fester as the band saw greater success, and it would ultimately come to full fruition with their fourth record. Pornography was a further delve into the abyss, and it's arguably the darkest record that they would ever produce. From the sound and overall tone of the album, to the behind the scenes dealings with labels and substance dependence and abuse in the case of some members, it was one of the most tumultuous and harsh points in the band's career. Yet despite these issues, the album is considered one of the band's best and is beloved by fans and critics alike. Though back when it first came out, it was seen with a mixed and even negative opinion. And as you can see from both the at the time and contemporary scores, how true this really was. The negative reception mixed with Robert Smith's tumultuous personal life would lead him to seek fulfillment in other projects, playing as a guitar player with Susie and the Banshees, as well as a side project called The Glove, it would reignite the spark that he had for The Cure, and in doing so, he would adopt a lot more of the psychedelic and pop influence and make them the most prominent elements of The Cure on future releases, with the comeback album The Top being the most outwardly psych-influenced record that they have ever produced, The Head in the Door adopting more pop sensibilities. and Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me being a combination of the two. Also bringing the band directly into the limelight of the 80s alternative scene with the wonderful yet overplayed Just Like Heaven. Essentially, Robert had gone out of his way to reinvent the band and taper down the darkness to a much lower degree in favor of a softer, lighter, and poppier sound. And while the melancholic elements were always there, they were never on as full of a display as the band's early work. 
and while well, early fans might have seen this as the band selling out, it was a very necessary growth that the band had to go through and a lucrative shift that brought them even greater success than they ever could have achieved with their more niche and intense sound. But due to some pressing life events, this would all come to a change at the end of the 80s. The Cure are currently halfway through their tour, having visited Eastern Europe and still snaking up to places like France before hitting America in September. I've enjoyed it more than any other tour since the Faith Tour because we're actually playing songs on stage that I want to play. That I want to play every single song that we play. Um, and we're playing lots of new songs and it's a very... The set, we've played for three hours some nights. Like we just keep playing if we want to keep playing and like and because people can go home if they want but we're like we're enjoying it so much that it builds from like it's a really really quiet slow opening and it builds and it goes into like frenzy by the time it gets to the end like many of the cures classics disintegration was born out of the pit of despair that robert smith had fell into i'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that smith struggled with depression i mean fuck the guy wrote faith in 17 seconds the money and fame that he had amassed would never put out the melancholic fire that raged within him. Something that particularly got under his skin was his mortality, and one of the main inspirations of what would become disintegration was Robert's realization that his youth was leaving him. The whole project was triggered by um, me writing the words to the song Disintegration about last April, around the time of my 29th birthday last year, and it was just about the sense of falling apart that I can't ever seem to shake off. I think, I think it's true for everyone, really. Um, that sort of triggered off a whole sort of sudden blurge of words over about a two-month period, and I, I just wanted the group, if we were going to do something else after the Kiss Me album, I knew that I wanted this to do something that had a bit of intensity to it. At a young age, he had achieved success greater than most, and felt that with rock music, by the time you hit 30, you've already released your best work, and it's only downhill from there. Now, obviously with hindsight bias, we know this is absolute bullshit, but at the moment, it was where Smith's head was stuck. And this would cause him to start obsessively writing music without the band, and coping by producing things that would be seen as depressive and somber. It all akened back to the band's earlier sound, and come to find, this was no accident. Robert had felt that various members of the band had grown swollen egos and thought one of the best ways to handle this was to not speak to the band at all during their studio sessions. As pretentious as this was, it was part of his attempt to bring back the atmosphere present during the recordings of pornography, as well as he would even mention in an interview that he had grown tired of the pop sound. I have to be like the, the most dull person in the world to only listen to one type of music. So w what we do is just we do what we feel like. Um, obviously, like to, to someone who doesn't really like The Cure, we all now have returned back and reverted back to, to style, but it's not actually true. I and mean, we started off as a, as a really dumb pop group when we did Three Magic Boys and Boys Don't Cry. So if anything, we're like, if we're on a circle, we're about halfway round again, so. Cross this with his dread of aging, and it's no surprise that Disintegration would become the record that it did, with another large part of that being the name itself, as it took on a lot of the dark and post-punk influence of the band's early days, but also took shape in a much more mature and well-rounded way. The pop and new wave elements that the band had adopted over the years didn't exactly disappear as much as they were repurposed to counter and at times even amplify the somber atmosphere of the record. Though, as intense as Smith would try to make things, keyboardist Roger O'Donnell would later remark in 2009 that the atmosphere was still pretty upbeat. I remember very clearly laughing and joking and fooling around in the control room while Robert was singing Disintegration, and then all of us trying to be serious when he came in to listen back. It was never a serious atmosphere in the studio, and when you think about the album and how dark it is, I'm sure people think we were sitting around slitting our wrists with candles and chains hanging from the walls. Not only does this shed light on how the album is both heavily emotional yet whimsical, but also that last sentence of that quote was one of the funniest lines I've heard in a while. Regardless, the 
atmosphere itself took on a cross-pollination of old and new Cure, much like the music did, and I'm sure that all helped play into the final product. And that final product just so happened to be the band's magnum opus, another strike of lightning caught in a bottle, and an album that bridged the gap between all the sounds that The Cure had played with over the years. And sure, I know some fanboys are going to screech at me in the comments about how basic and popular of a choice this is labels the band's finest work, but let's not pretend like this wasn't the record that came to define the band in the aisles of history. You fucking nerds. Just talking about the album quickly, this album's kind of gone back into that area of faith maybe. A little bit more kind of lonesome maybe. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know, it's it's like when you do anything you have to live with it. It's like I felt, you know, a bit morose I suppose, at a certain time early last summer. I suspect because of 30 creeping towards me. And right. um, You've got nothing else to be upset about, No, you? no, that's no. what I mean. Uh, and it was only for like a short period, but I, I liked the idea of, of The Cure getting back involved in something a bit more intense. Uh -huh. But unfortunately, I forgot that like a year later I'd have to be explaining away why. why. When Disintegration was released, it was the end of an era, the closing moments of the 80s, a time in music and pop culture where almost anything went. And while it's easy to write the decade off due to the number of boomers who still lust after that bygone era, the truth is, there really isn't any other decade quite like it. The album dropped on May 2nd, 1989, and for an album that deals with aging, it almost serves as an embodiment in capturing that feeling many had towards the end of that decade and what it meant for music in general, especially in terms of The Cure and their sound and tone. But to speak about the record itself, the music of Disintegration is a beautiful cross of just about every sound The Cure had played with up to that point, with a great mixture of pop elements, the darkness of the early years, and even some sensibilities of three imaginary boys with the album's guitar work. Disintegration opens up with Plain Song, a track that wastes no time at all in setting the mood of the record ahead of us. It carries both a melancholic and bright tone, but in a way that doesn't exactly contradict itself. Rather, it complements both sides of itself with a bittersweet sound. The iconic synths and Robert's one-of-a-kind voice really carry the track. I think I'm old and I'm feeling pain, you said, and that's all running out like it's the end of the world, you said. And it's so cold. It's like the cold if you were dead. And then you smiled for a second. The lyrics to Plain Song also waste no time in jumping into the album's main theme of aging, where Robert speaks on his feelings of growing older, feeling as if his world is coming to an end, coincidentally capturing the sentiment of the decade where the 80s was coming to a close and its era was about to fade into the aisles of history. This same feeling is carried over into the next track, Pictures of You, but rather the theme being about fear of aging, it's actually about regret over lost time with a loved one. Remembering you how you used to be. Slow drowned, you were angels. So much more than everything. Hold for the last time, then slip away quietly. 
open my eyes, but I never see anything. If only I'd thought of the right words, I could have held on to your heart. If only I'd thought of the right words, I wouldn't be breaking apart all my pictures of you. Looking so long at these pictures of you, but I never hold on to your heart. Looking so long for the words to be true, and always just breaking apart my pictures of you. The lyrics are about Robert's wife, Mary Poole, and the amount of time he had wasted before marrying her. The couple had been friends since they were 14, being rather close for half of their lifetime before tying the knot. And when one dwells on their mortality, it's only natural to begin to regret all the time wasted. Whether that would be time alone or with those who didn't matter, especially when weighed against the time that could have been spent with those we love most. While there are a few different stories on the origins of the song's meaning, such as a house fire, a non-existent poem, as well as one where Smith just threw out his personal photos for some reason, the reality is, is that they hold no actual weight, as Robert has admitted to lying about things to make everything seem more interesting. Plus, the song's true meaning about regretting lost time just holds far more weight in the context of the record, even if musically it's far more bright and colorful than most of the other tracks off the record. The album's next song, however, Close Down, inches a lot closer to the older sound of the band. Again, not getting nearly as dark as their peak post-punk years, but paying service to it nonetheless, with the lyrics themselves expressing the very things that fueled the band's early days. I'm running out of time, I'm out of step and closing down, and never sleep for waning hours. The empty hours of greed and uselessly always the need to feel again the relief belief of something more than mockery. If only I could fill my heart with love. Sleepless nights of anxiety and frustration and a dependence on drugs to keep things going. It's something that many artists go through, but as they get older, they have to let it go. The song also serves as a build up to what would become one of the band's biggest songs the legendary love song. Like many bands, despite the enormous success and countless covers that have been done of this track, Robert himself is iffy about it, praising it for being the first time he felt confident enough to write a straightforward love song but also feeling as if it was his weakest track on this record, though I heavily disagree with him on this. Love Song is the reprieve of the album as well as a turning point, a moment where the record drops nearly all of its gloom for at least a moment while Robert serenades his wife, and as the song was originally written, it was for a wedding gift for Mary. Yeah, it was um, because me and Mary got married last year and I couldn't think what to give her for a wedding present, so I wrote her that song. Cheap and cheerful. But contextually, it's also the album's turning point, like I mentioned before. Because from here on out, Disintegration turns down its pop elements quite a bit and lets the darkness begin to take much more of a strong hold, with the melancholy really starting to stack up. Something that is instantly apparent on my personal favorite song off the album, Last Dance. Just from the intro of the song alone, its atmosphere is completely different from all that came before it, being much thicker and hazier, and with those beautiful guitar leads coming in, it paints a bleak and haunting picture of pain and loss, and this only becomes heavier once Robert's vocals take center stage. I'm so glad you came, I'm so glad you remembered, to see how we're ending our last dance together, reluctantly, cautiously, but prettier than ever. I really believe that this time it's forever, but Christmas falls late now, flatter and colder, and never as bright as when we used to fall, and even if we drink, I don't think we will kiss, 
and the way that we did when that woman was only a girl. The song tells a tale of encountering someone you once loved, who in the past meant the world to you. But after years, that spark and warmth is just gone. The feelings are long past, and outside of familiarity and a cold sense of being acquainted, all that's left are memories of what once was. Continuing a similar theme is what we heard on Pictures of You, and its theme of lost time, as well as Plain Song's fear of aging. Lullaby, however, takes a very different approach, bringing more humor and lightheartedness to the surface of its darkness, with some fantastic songwriting and lyrics describing a monster who feeds off children. His arms are around me and his tongue in my eyes. The Spider-Man character described in the song's lyrics come from the scary stories Robert's uncle told him as a kid, but when thrown into the context of the record, he can be seen as an allegory for either Smith's addictions or depression. And I feel like I'm being eaten by a thousand million shivering furry holes, and I know that in the morning I will wake up in the shivering cold, and the Spider-Man is always hungry. The song Fascination Street follows next, and while musically it's more upbeat, the song itself is a debaucherous nightmare, telling of a time that the band had a debaucherous romp in Bourbon Street in New Orleans. Oh, it's opening time down on Fascination Street, so let's cut the conversation and get out for a bit, because I feel it all fading and paling and begging to drag you down with me to kick the last nail in. Yeah, I like you in that, like, I like you to scream. But if you open your mouth, then I can't be responsible for quite what goes in or to care what comes out. So just pull out your hair, just pull on your pout. <laughs> Look, you already know what these lyrics imply. And the rough and violent nature of them, when paired with the previous song Lullaby, tells of a struggle between feeling overpowered and wanting to be the one who holds the power. Or, you know, maybe it's just about drunk sex, who knows. But as with any high, there is always the come down. Prayers for Rain is a killer track, somber yet angry, slow yet powerful. It's one of the album songs that really reaches for that dark aura of The Cure's early work, and its lyrics don't disappoint either. You fracture me, your hands on me, a touch so plain so stale it kills. You strangle me, entangle me in hopeless and prayers for rain. I deteriorate, I live in dirt and nowhere glows but drearily and tired, the hours all spent on killing Tam again, all waiting for the rain." The rain in this song seems to be a metaphor for hope, like having dying crops from a dry spell and begging and pleading with God to bring down rain in order to bring the crops back to life, or in this case, the joy and excitement Robert has ceased feeling, as his anxiety and depression over his mortality have taken over him. It's a powerful song and another favorite of mine because it strikes at the heart of Disintegration's themes, both musically and lyrically, capturing the desperation for meaning, life, and color in a bleak reality. And speaking of a bleak reality, we've reached the nine minute monster, the same deep water as you. While it's the album's longest track, it makes up for it in substance. Coming close to that early 80s Cure sound that the band had spent a majority of the record channeling. I know I've used the word somber quite a bit in this video, but the same deep water as you defines that word in every single way. The soft whines of Robert as he sings about his inability to match his lover's level of loyalty and emotion, being in the same deep water while not reaching her depth. It's a powerful and moving track that shows off the band's unmatched talent in atmospheric songwriting, creating a thick and almost suffocating fog of depressive longing. 
though this atmosphere is contradicted with the album's title track and second longest song, Disintegration. This track is my second favorite off the record, and one of the band's best songs across their entire catalog. It was the first track written for the project, and the genesis of the sound and direction that the band would go as they wrote the record. I miss the kiss of treachery, the aching kiss before I feed, the stench of a love for a younger meat, and the sound that it makes when it cuts in deep, the holding up on bended knees, the addiction of duplicities, as bit by bit it starts the need to just let go my party piece. The lyrics detail a story of infidelity and lust of a younger man, someone who took advantage of his lovers in a repugnant and unrepentant fashion. But after years of this, it left him hollow, with a bridge of the song proclaiming, And now that I know that I'm breaking to pieces, I'll pull out my heart and I'll feed it to anyone. I'm crying for sympathy, crocodiles cry, for the love of the crowd and the three cheers from everyone. Dropping through sky, through the glass of the roof, through the roof of your mouth, through the mouth of your eye, through the eye of the needle, it's easier for me to get closer to heaven than ever feel whole again. The mention of crocodile tears and breaking himself apart for the love of the crowd is Robert's way of saying how regardless of how much of a monster he once was, his crocodile tears of love and passion are what built his career and made him millions. But with all that he's done, it's left him hollow and empty, recounting that it would be easier for him to get into heaven than to be okay, a reference to the Bible verse Matthew 19.24. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. A reference that really bats home the lyrics of the song, especially when paired with the fantastic vocal performance on the track, and in my opinion, brings an end to the album's high point. From here, the record starts to come to a close with its final two tracks, these ones being much shorter than what came before, as well as far lighter in tone and atmosphere. Homesick still holds on to the sadness displayed across the record, but in a more piano ballad approach and stripped down production style which allows it to differentiate itself, with the majority of the track being an instrumental buildup and its vocal portion being a half-sung reading of a poem, where Robert begs for just one more while never specifying what he wants. The lyrics hint at the track being about him wrestling with putting the band to rest, as before disintegration, he had thought about ending the project. But in all due respect, that's just speculation, and the track serves as a vague yet heartfelt plea for one more chance. Now, the album's actual closer is a beautifully named track titled Untitled, where the lighthearted sound of the band's popular work comes to the forefront led by a sad accordion as the track's backbone. But don't let these pop elements fool you. This is Disintegration's swan song. With an album like this, there's no way it's going to have a happy ending never quite said what I wanted to say to you, never quite managed the words to explain to you, never quite knew how to make them believable, and now that the time has gone, another time undone, hopelessly fighting the devil futilely, feeling the monster climb deeper inside of me, feeling him gnawing my heart away hungrily, I'll never lose this pain, and I'll never dream of you again. Just as it started, disintegration ends on a bitter note leaving the listener to wrestle with the album that they've just heard. A struggle with mortality and the loss of youth. A confessional where the artist tells of his regrets and past sins. While Disintegration is far from The Cure's darkest material, it is one of their finest offerings. And to many, including myself here, it's their best.
Disintegration would be released to critical acclaim for the most part, with only a handful of outlets giving it middling reviews at worst. But for the fans, it was massive. An album for both the new and old fans that contained more heart than what had been heard in quite a while. The band would follow up by supporting the record on some massive tours, and much like other times Robert Smith wrestled with ending the band's career, he relented and kept it going, producing further material throughout the 90s and 2000s, and keeping the band going as a touring act in the 2010s and even now in the 2020s. And he would even make a few more hits along the way, including the infamous Friday I'm In Love. And despite being over the age of 30, he could still create defining and amazing works. Disintegration itself is an album that most bands fail to stay together long enough to make. And that's the album where the band redefines and rebirths themselves for an entirely new generation. The Cure is an amazing band for many reasons. And their career is one that many artists should take note of and study. Not just for Robert Smith's powerful songwriting, but for the cues and change and experimentation while also staying true to the roots that got you there. Robert himself is also a story that tells of a man who struggled with his mortality, the way that almost all of us do. Yet he found solace in the art that he created and used the same fears and anxieties that plagued him to manifest and create some of the best music ever written. So, if you're a creative type, maybe you should take note. But with all that being said, subscribe, support me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter, I'll see you in the next video.